kilometers altitude uh, Bavaria. Uh, the second night was in Ronsberg, the green one, at about uh, 850 meters altitude with poor conditions because of clouds. And the third night was in Geigersau, a very good place um, here uh, uh, for the maximum night. And uh, so what uh, we both did was classic photo uh, photography, having nice pictures here from the Valla Alm. You see what it is about. You have uh, a ski, um, a tourism device, and a nice purse aid. And what the, what the advantage is of the classic DSLR photos is that, for example, you see the colors of the purse aids very well. Uh, most of them have a development from red to green, and about that green we have to talk about later because this comes from the so-called green train. And that's something I'm interested in, in the morphology of the meteor, in, of the individuality of a meteor. Not so much counting, but um, uh, what, is this, uh, what is the shape of the individual meteor. But then you can combine uh, photos. This is a combined uh, version. Can we shortly switch off the light just to have one uh, one moment to see it, uh, because it's seven per se, it's not only the bright ones. And um, my goal is to have high resolution in the photo that you have a filigrane structure of the, of the meteors. So thank you again. C can we switch back again? Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, I like that, okay, okay. So now we were quite lucky that uh, in the third night in Geigersau, uh, we were facing north, main direction, and uh, we had polar lights. And uh, this, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Jürgen points to, to his T-shirt. Uh, please stand up and show it, uh, because it's not the same photo. Uh, but <laughs> he has a T-shirt already. I only have, I only have uh, this one. But I uh, uh, want to present you a little time-lapse uh, sequence. This, what I show you, seems to be a video, but it is not. It is a, a sequence of photos, and you will see the difference. Because in a single photo, the meteor is just a streak. And uh, to, to show it visually better, I made in a little delay effect for each meteor. You, you will only see four per se. It's but a lot of clouds and Corona Borealis as well. Integration time was for each photo was 14 seconds, so four images per minute. Lots of planes, lots of satellites, unfortunately, and lots of clouds. But still, there was a meteor. Oh, this is a laser, by the way, for by the. So now comes first. Don't say it. Hope you see it. there it is. Corona Borealis glows up, another per se. And clouds come up. The brightest one. And so that is what photography can make. You have a long uh, exposure time and uh, so last per se. So that is uh, what photography can do very well. Uh, you can uh, integrate small, uh, slow movements over a longer time. And the, there are also uh, meteor components that, des uh, that deserve longer exposure. For example, persistent trains. We were also hunting for persistent trains, but unfortunately didn't get any. But we were prepared. So this was the sky on Ronsberg uh, when we arrived there a little, I think, one hour before midnight. And this was very poor condition and we were frustrated. Um, and um, by frustration, I did not immediately start to set up my camera. That was a mistake. I simply lie on my mat and looked at the sky. Uh, and I found this one. And now it becomes interactive, hopefully. Because this website is really great. You all know it, I hope. And uh, I saw with my eyes this fireball coming exactly from the radiant 
very slowly, as you would expect it well, from the Perseid, but then I noticed it, couldn't, it cannot be a Perseid because it was longer and longer and longer and uh, it flew exactly over me and I had to turn around and I had time enough for that and see it glow uh, at about 45 degrees to the horizon. And uh, you can see me here, that's me. So uh, together with this observer, I'm, we are the only ones who saw it as an earth grazer that it was, but not the Perseid. And interestingly, and this is uh, so uh, still you can uh, make some science about that, Fripon caught this meteor with two cameras, but unfortunately the cameras were in line. So their trajectory was very, very wrong because I can prove I was right under the meteor and this would not be the case if the tra trajectory was that. And there is a photo as well from another observer this, this one is uh, by Ralf B, uh, who, what, oops, I'm sorry, very nice. And this is a photo I missed because I had not set up my camera at that moment. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, this is uh, Aberglaube, we say in German. But okay, um, I don't want to stress this too much. Uh, we, I, I was kind of lucky and unlucky in one. So that's a very typical feeling for meteor observation, I think. Okay, but, uh, so I skip that. But um, uh, then I, uh, after this experience, I've set up my cameras immediately and photographed clouds and clouds and clouds and uh, presented this already, but very briefly, what it is about with the All Sky Twin uh, Mike, I know why you hate fish eye lenses, so I use two of them <laughs> and try to to get rid of the uh, shortcomings. But I will explain why and where, what for. If you make video, you usually have a camera with a 16 by 9 uh, format. And this is very inefficient for all sky, because if you use it with a circular fish eye, you only reach about 44% efficiency you only reach 44% of your photosites of the of the active photosites of the sensor. If you use a diagonal fish eye, um, you are much better in the photosites efficiency, but you lose a lot of sky. You only cover 54% of the sky, and uh, so the efficiency is. I mean, it's uh, 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 squaring the circle. Old problem, uh, never to be so solved. So what I did uh, is uh, this solution. I have it with me. We can play around anyone who's interested afterwards. I have these two um, uh, fisheye lenses for Canon EOS. And the adapter for the Sony E-mount is a shift adapter, uh, which can shift the lens nine millimeters up or down. And so I use two cameras, a north and a south camera, and two lenses. Uh, and this is uh, my solution here to have a little overlap between the cameras and to have an overall efficiency of about 82% because the 40 millimeter, 40 millimeters is a little bit too long for this. Okay, so this is the other two cameras and what they do, the north camera makes uh, uh, shifted to the north, the south camera is shifted to the south. The optical axes are aligned so there's no difference in distortion between the images. And if you glue that together in Photoshop, you can have nice image like this. This is four times 4K resolution. So what you see is a downscaling of one to, you only see a quarter of the resolution. And uh, by the way, North is on the left side and you have Corona Borealis as well. The original resolution is that. So that's quite nice, and uh, I know, Mike, you hate the curved uh, path of the meteor. I can understand that, but all sky is still all sky. Okay, the last one, uh, and I have four minutes left for that, is uh, video observations we did, <coughs> or I did, and uh, Bernd as well. And the first one was uh, still the hunt for meteor halos. Um, uh, in uh, 2022, I presented a brief theory about the morphology of meteor halos. 
and I was uh, hunting, uh, continuing my hunt for that, for that, f um, especially for the outer halo and the inner halo, and used uh, three of these cameras. By the way, there's a cool box, um, a cool device, GPS time code generator in the field, very valuable, so you can precisely uh, synchronize many cameras via audio time code. Okay, and the best meter I found, unfortunately, was this one. So outside of the <laughs> field of view, I cropped in and zoomed in, um, scale to one to one right now. Uh, it has a nice green train, it has a terminal flash. You saw the bluish afterglow, the, the, the outer halo you have seen, so it's a reality because it's not a camera artifact because the terminal flash is outside of the field. Very nice, yeah, that was the brightest uh, Perseid. Uh, it had a green train, it had a terminal flash, it showed a persistent train for sure, <coughs> uh, Bernd has photographed it, and it had the blue afterglow, the outer halo, but unfortunately it was outside the field of view of my main camera. Okay. But there was another one, the second, um, the second brightest uh, was this one. Now we see two camera, uh, the images of two cameras in the upper part, the overview camera and the lower part, the detail camera, which was set to a very short integration time. Oops, I'm sorry, here we go. Very nice green train, terminal flash. And of course, it was very fast, so now we, we uh, make slow motion. And you see the motion blur in the upper um, video and no motion blur in the lower video because of the short integration time. But as I hoped, there are no structures of inner halo in the uh, lower part. Uh, the meter is still not bright enough to show that. Um, yeah, the hunt goes on. So, this fireball had a green train. Yes, it had a terminal flash. Yes, it had a persistent train also. You can see that still here, the, the persistent train. And a green afterglow, a medium halo it showed. Unfortunately, no inner halo. So, I'm still on the hunt for the holy grail of the meteor halos. Okay, and the second purpose was uh, together with uh, Bernd. Bernd had uh, uh, such a camera as well, and he used a narrow band filter on the forbidden green line of uh, 557.7 nanometer, uh, which is the green train of the meteor. You see one here. And um, so I, so this is a counting, by the way, of my main camera. Uh, the camera is quite sensitive uh, with, this, with this combination of a 24 millimeter wide angle lens. I had about uh, 274 meteors inside two hours and 21 minutes. This is counted and um, I, I'm still not finished with the video counting. But we also uh, checked for meteors with green trains in the lower left area of my videos because that was the overlap to his camera. He had a camera with a 50 millimeter lens and we have now um, to check double observations and uh, in the first night we have 10 candidates and in the third night we have 12 candidates so that we can make a combined um, uh, analysis of these meteors and the green trains. I can tell you we will publish that later uh, have a very strange and interesting behavior. So very briefly, why did I uh, present this? Because the original subject I wanted to present, I'm still stuck. And this is an outcry to the community, please help me. I have 48 hours of double station per se observations and I don't know how to process them because the software I use is, is not working. And uh, I think that would be very interesting results. So who wants to join, please ask me. Thank you very much. I'm in time. Thank you, Peter. Just in time. Time for questions. One or two questions. Over there. So, 
everyone is fearing if he's asking a question, he has to do the coding for you. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you again, Peter. Thank you.